Okay, here's the spoiler-free review of the second movie, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. After the events of the first movie, a new family moves into the same house, the house where Nancy and her family lived. The teenager of the family is Jesse. After recently moving to this house, he starts having bad dreams. Freddy is back, and this time he isn't killing teens in their dreams. He's trying to possess Jesse. As much as I'm going to sound like a broken record, the first one didn't really need a sequel, but this is a very interesting concept. I do think that the execution left a bit to be desired, the acting is decent. Considering what this is a sequel to, it's strange that there really aren't that many memorable nightmares. In fact, I'd go so far as to say there really is only one, and it's the opening scene. That is a pretty good opening, but it's the only thing the movie has that's quite like it. Jesse's struggle to maintain control of his body is well done and among the best aspects of the film. Like the first, this is psychological horror. In fact, there's fairly little gore in this. Other than the seventh, it might be the one that has the least of it. The director of photography from the first one returns and you can tell this is filmed very well. Kruger is still not taunting verbally as much as he later comes to. The characters don't feel all that developed or likable or interesting. Several of them are obnoxious. Honestly, the only ones I liked were the two leads, Jesse and the female lead. This can be genuinely funny at times. The eerie theme of the first one is gone but this can still be fairly creepy, and there is again disgusting content, sexually suggestive content, although in this one begins the trend of it leaning just towards the bizarre more than the creepy, and that's only going to get worse as the series progresses. The script is pretty good for how soon this came out, I mean this is just one year after the original, but this also is the shortest of all seven. It's 79 minutes long without credits. And I honestly can't claim that it really gripped me for more than maybe a third of that time. Abandon all hope of not hearing spoilers for the second movie, all ye who enter here. Or watch beyond this point. Whatever. So it's five years later and everybody's forgotten what happened. Granted, they do bring up that someone died in this house and another person went crazy, but still. No one's looking for warning signs that Freddy might be coming back. All of these teenagers, weren't they old enough to perceive what was going on? I mean, did they all just move there? I got the impression that only Jesse was new to the neighborhood. I guess I get the approach they took with him gradually losing control of his own body as Freddy took over, but I do kind of think that the Christine approach might have been more interesting. Instead of this innocent person being corrupted by evil, have it be someone who flirts a little with evil, lets it in, and then all hell breaks loose. Or at least if they'd had a more substantial reason for Freddy choosing this vessel. I mean, I get that it's because they read about him in the journal that if you look closely enough you'll be able to tell it's actually completely blank, but what about it said oh no, he's coming to take me over. I don't know. In the first one, it was, if you believe in him, he can kill you, or at least hurt you in your dreams. In this one, it's, if you believe in him, he can take you over. I will say that it was pretty well done. You know, and him and Freddy talking through the same mouth, him visible inside Freddy's mouth, very creepy. The first scene with the bus, was a good concept for a nightmare. It's again this kind of vulnerable position, you know, when you're in a car driven by someone else, especially one that's able to inflict serious harm upon its passengers and anyone it runs into, you are entrusting your life, or at least the use of your legs and such, to the driver, and that is a situation that can get really scary really fast. I also love how they're trapped between Freddy and the back of the bus, and if they walk to the back of the bus, it's gonna tip over. 
So they have to walk towards Freddy a little bit just to keep up the balance. That was a great idea. Don't you just love the introduction on the coach? You can tell that he's serious. He's got a gray Adidas shirt on. So Jesse and the other guy fight. Or they roll around on top of each other a bit. When Jesse wakes up and the snake is there and it was actually there, who the hell put it there? How did no one notice? I don't know, did I look away for a second and miss something? Am I the only one who thought that, you know, with the bus scene and all, Jesse was being set up as being a dork and unpopular? Also, when I first saw the jock friend, I didn't think he was a friend. Certainly not apparently the best friend. Okay, I'm no expert, but they're pretty fucking bad at doing push-ups, aren't they? Do they do a single, complete, proper push-up in that training bit? Oh god. Jesse dances. I'm not actually the only person who finds the bit with the toasted bird really, really silly, am I? I mean, it wasn't even really scary. It was just weird. I guess it's Freddy's return and everything's getting warmer, hotter, I should say, including Jesse's girlfriend. But it just really wasn't that intimidating. Okay, so the S&M Club, I'm sure I'm not the first, won't be the last, but I just gotta say, WTF? And then the evil, mean coach has him do laps, and he pushes him into some chairs. And then ensues the shower death scene, which is just plain silly. I know that it's not supposed to be taken seriously, and one shouldn't overanalyze an invisible entity slapping a grown man's butt with towels until it gets red. I guess the S&M community got a kick out of that. But isn't it supposed to be wet towels? Those seem to dry to me. Other than it's an awe-inspiring title, what exactly is Freddy getting revenge for in this particular one? Someone turning their back on him in the first film? I mean, going by the ending of the first movie, he wasn't vanquished. Yeah, I know, too much charmed. Wasn't the first one where he tried to get revenge? And the person most affected by what happens in this film is Jesse, and he apparently wasn't there for the whole parents burning the child killer thing. Mommy, I'm scared. Of course, you'll have to take my word for that because I'm not acting scared. When we find out that the father was actually dumb enough to buy a murder, or suicide anyway, house, did anybody else think of that bit in that Treehouse of Horror episode of The Simpsons where Homer realizes that he bought a house built atop an ancient Indian burial ground and angrily calls up the realtor. After a short conversation, he hangs up and says he said he mentioned it three or four times. You're reading too much into this. All it is is you're going insane. The POV of Freddy and then it turns out to be Jesse going up to the sister, that was pretty interesting. Freddy is hardly in this one, and that is a good thing, you know, keeping him mysterious, but I think the first one did a better job of keeping him present, of making it feel like he was still there, you know, like in the original Predator movie. I feel like I'm losing my mind, and I can't drag you into the abyss with me. Let's fuck? Okay. Does anybody else get a kick out of the fact that Jesse could have been Uncle Jesse, you know, demon tongue and all? John Stamus actually auditioned for the role. I need you to let me stay here. Are you out of your mind? I'm getting there. The eye inside Freddy's mouth was really cool. That bit where Grady, I think his name was, is trying to run away. Did anybody else feel like he should have been saying, save me Lamal, save me with your ridiculous hairdo that no one outside of the 80s could possibly get away with. That is a sturdy fucking door. And then there are some of Jesse's lines, which are a little unfortunate. He's inside of me. He wants to take me again. He owns me. I am Freddy Krueger's bitch. Don't look at me. The only line I made up was that last one. This isn't happening. It is real. She wasn't crazy. Oh no, the water in the pool is getting hot. It's a good thing that we can just, you know, get out. That bit where they're trying to open the door from both sides, do they ever at some point not push from both sides? Because it's never going to open if they push from both sides at the same time. 
isn't it fairly early in the franchise for this to take it out of the dream world?